operating system. In this short video, we're going to look at the components, structure and function as a survey of the very parts of the immune system. It is a complicated system, and so the idea in this video is to give you a, a perspective, an overview, a sort of a roadmap to the components of the system. We're going to follow the approach of looking at the system as a um, sort of divided into a matrix of, uh, of dimensions where we have two dimensions really. The first dimension divides it into whether it is specific or non-specific. And the second dimension divides it into whether it is humoral or cellular. The term humoral really means chemical, but because some of the chemicals are quite complicated and they're biomolecules, they are rather large. And instead of using the word chemical, which usually means smaller moieties, we, we use um, the term humoral, which is also a traditional term. So we're going to look at these several um, dimensions uh, and we'll start off with the non-specific components. Now, the, the, in the very outset, we can see from the non-specific, in the non-specific section, we have a very obvious structure that should be um, obvious to all of us, that the skin and its the linings of our bodies actually form the first barrier to any entities that are trying to get inside us and, and uh, do damage or take control of us uh, in some way. And so the skin cells themselves are cells, dermis, epidermis cells, squamous epithelium, and the uh, subdermis. These are cells which and and also the linings which line the internal organs, uh, well, the alimentary canal, which are actually the external environment in the mucosal membranes. So they are actually forming a barrier from the, between the internal and external environment. And they, they're non-specific, meaning they are defending us against all sorts of different things that are trying to, to, to get inside our internal environment. Attached to the, to the skin and the mucosal membranes, uh, secretions such as lysosomes, these are chemicals. Lysosomes, um, saliva, and um, mucus, which line the cells and the mucosal membranes. I'm going to write most of these entities uh, with a, with a, in this particular format where we're going to write them as, as curved boundaries here, just to distinguish them with processes we'll talk about a bit later. So that, that's a fairly obvious um, uh, non-specific structure. Looking at more detailed um, entities in, in still the non-specific chemical uh, moieties we have um, chemicals called kinins which are a variety of chemicals there's quite a few of them they are chemicals that actually promote movement hence the word kinin kinetic means movement we have prostaglandins which are sort of like hormones which send messages between various entities in the system and we have lymphokines which as the name suggests lymphokine means it gets lymphocytes moving and acting so they are generally uh, active the main one however as far as a chemical is concerned is histamine now, histamine is a peptide, not a very large peptide, but it's a very 
um, strongly active peptide, has many receptors throughout the body, and is one of the main chemicals that actually sets in place the process of the inflammatory response, which we'll talk about in a moment. In addition to these um, rather small chemicals gen in general, we have some more complicated ones, which one of them is called complement. And complement is a complex series of peptides. This is about 10 to 20, depending on how you categorize them, series of peptides, and they are involved in uh, the process of destroying cells. But they're actually hormones. Um, sorry, they're, they're not hormones, they're peptides and they have an action on an attacking cells. The other one, will, um, which refers mainly to viruses and maybe cancers, is the chemical interferon, which is a very low level chemical. It's a peptide, it's a series of peptides. And that's to do mainly with uh, viruses. Um, a little bit similar to complement, but it's not really the same in the sense of its mode of action is quite different. Complement is, is, is a more complicated system, but all of these are in, um, general in the sense they're non-specific. They don't attack one particular antigen. They are uh, quite general in their action. Just on the word antigen, let's look at that word antigen. Antigen is the is the chief target of what we're looking for. It may be something a foreign invading organism, such as a bacteria, or maybe a virus, or, or some sort of a parasite, uh, or it actually could be in some cases our own cells which get damaged or mutate and present a problem for the body, in which case the antigen is uh, a structure which is going to be attacked by the immune system. And a small part of the antigen is usually presented to the immune system and that's called a hapton, which is a, a structure within the antigen that actually uh, it has to do with the recognition by the immune system that the antigen is present and an action must be taken. So they are really the focus of the action of the immune system. So we need to be aware of those. But that, that in a way, is the bad guys. So let's get on with the system. Let's look at now the non-specific cellular components. So non-specific cellular components are cells. The main ones, if we had to choose one to start off with, would be the neutrophil. The neutrophil is a white blood cell, and there are many of them. It's the main type of white blood cell. It's, if you like, with the analogy of the army or the armed forces, it's the, it's the attack soldier, or the normal trooper, that has a very wide range of activities and is a general strike um, defense component, which uh, can uh, attach to cells, cells send signals, uh, can even um, eat cells. It's a phagocyte, but it's not a very, it has a, doesn't, not a very large cell, so it can't eat too much of the, the too many um, of the invading antigens. So the bigger one that does most of the Phagocytosis, phagocytosis means to eat cells, is the macrophage, and the macrophage literally means large eater. So they are the two main types of non-specific cells. There is a third one called the NK cell, natural killer cell, which is more of a sort of a specific um, and specialized cell, but it has similar functions. It can um, uh, maybe look at other cell types that the neutrophils and macrophages don't deal with directly or don't recognize. Again, all of these are non-specific. There is another group of cells called mast cells, which are interesting because they are made and live without, throughout the body waiting for something to happen, often, often in tissues near blood vessels, and they can actually morph into macrophages and start to, um, start to um, the inflammatory process. The process of histamine, we've already mentioned, uh, actually um, is involved in that, and it's mast cells and histamine are almost the first stages of the inflammatory response, which we'll talk about a little bit later on.
they are the main components of the non-specific cellular uh, aspects of the immune system. Let's look now at uh, the specific humoral, the chemical. The main, there's one main component of this, very, very significant, com significant component, and that is the antibodies. There are a number of different types of antibodies. We're not going to go into the details of those, but antibodies are Y-shaped proteins which latch onto the antigens uh, are made by the B cells, which we'll talk about in a moment, and at, attach very strongly to the uh, antigens and can disable antigens very quickly. And we'll talk about that, how that's done in a moment. They are specific, though, for particular proteins on the antigens presented as haptins to the cells that are going to make them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Let's now look at the specific cellular category. The, there are two main types of this category. There are the B cells, they're, they're both lymphocytes. We have the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. Uh, what, lymphocytes are white blood cells, so you can see them down a microscope quite easily. Um, the B lymphocytes are turn into what are called plasma cells and they make antibodies at a very rapid rate when uh, are presented with an, an antigen when the antigen is apparent and the B cells are told to uh, that their antigen is present they turn into plasma cells and plasma cells uh, make many antibodies about 2000 per second once they get going so very fast acting. Remembering that antibodies are quite large and complicated structures, so the, the cells are really a work there. Once the B cell has done its work, the plasma cells have done its work, a certain percentage of the B cells become memory B cells. So that once the first time that the antigen is presented and destroyed, it uh, the B cells uh, some of them change into memory B cells and they stay in the body for hopefully the rest of the life of the organism and uh, remember the shape of the antigen so that when, if it comes back again the the um, uh, the, the uh, antibodies can be made much more quickly uh, in the first time it happens it usually takes about uh, a couple of days to, to actually go through the process of making a plasma cell and then into the antibodies with mem if memory B cells are present it can only need a few hours to actually start up so incredibly important cells to defend strongly against uh, antigens the T cells uh, are a little bit similar but really very different in the sense they're similar in the sense that they use the recognition of the antigen shapes so they recognize those but they attack instead of making antibodies they actually attack from the cells using cells themselves. And there are three types of cells that are used in this. There are the cytotoxic C cell, which is the main type. And they're sometimes called effective T cells. There's the helper T cells, which promote really the whole immune system, including the other T cells. And the last one are the suppressor T cells, which actually switches everything off. And if we didn't have that, our immune system would go out of control. So they're all very important. The cytotoxic T cell does most of the work of actually um, destroying the um, invading uh, um, antigen. And the helper T cell aids that. The suppresses T cells, make sure it, it's regulated. <clears throat> so if you like, the helper T cell is like an accelerator of the system and the um, suppressor T cell is a break in the system. That is a, that is, they're the main components, not necessarily the functionality. Let's, let's, we've got the main players in the game now. There is actually um, a couple of extra ones which you might 
hereof you'll have CD4 and CD8. They're actually components of CTELs, but they don't get talked about a lot, but they're actually sort of subsections of those uh, particular types of cells. Now, let's look at the actual interrelationships and functionality of these cells now. So we're looking at particularly um, how do they work together. Now, let's look firstly at the inflammatory response and so the inflammatory response is, I'm going to put it here and I'm going to call it IR for short, inflammatory response. You could say that the inflammatory response is the main type of response that occurs. When It can occur when you're invaded with an antigen such as a bacteria or a virus or some other organism or even if you have just cellular damage, if you played a game of sport and you have a lot of bruising, you've got cells that are disrupted or ruptured or uh, you've got tissues that are not uh, in correct form, they need to be uh, mopped up, cleaned up. That's the job of um, the inflammatory response. The mast cells detect that, they're lying in tissues and there is histamine created uh, from often from the basophils and the mast cells. <clears throat> the mast cells then turn into macrophages and start eating up the um, uh, the tissues that need to be destroyed. There is uh, kinins which bring in other substances. Now kinins means movement. So this these chemical signals mean that a lot of fluid goes into the uh, into the process and we get an increase in fluid in the region where the uh, issue, issue is occurring. Uh, we also get increase in temperature which leads to a fever and a fever is again a non-specific response. It, uh, it means that the temperature is elevated um, and we can also get that when we're invaded by antigens so the fever actually can be when we get involved with a specific response as well so fever can also happen in this particular case. The advantage of having a higher body temperature is our, our cells do better than the antigen cells uh, in general. In general, not always the case, but in, most of the time when we get a fever, our body is operating more efficiently and it's putting at the disadvantage bacterial cells, for example, which don't like the higher temperatures. So in the inflammatory response, we actually get a fever. Uh, so a fever is actually a good thing. We don't want to think of it as a good thing, the only problem when it becomes an issue is if it goes too high and actually starts destroying our own tissues because of the um, denaturation of the proteins. Anything above 40 degrees is a problem and any, if it goes higher than that it becomes very much a problem. But normally we, um, we operate in that zone quite comfortably and we can uh, get rid of the um, invading organism more quickly that way. So the inflammatory response is important to understand. And it is non-specific in general, unless it, it's to do with a particular virus or bacteria. But it is also uh, in, in, a, in a general sense as well. Now, key to other communications are the macrophages. When the macrophages are activated and neutrophils are activated, I should um, bring in the neutrophils there because they're very important in, uh, in the general immune response. Um, for example, when you play a game of sport and you've had a, a, a bruising game of sport, then you're quite sore and, and have bruising. The neutrophils actually are used up and uh, don't survive the treatment of um, fixing up the tissues. And we get a lack of neutrophils. We can actually measure that uh, a day or so after the sporting event. If you take a blood sample, you'll have a lower neutrophil content as the body is recovering from that particular event. It's quite an interesting process. But these neutrophils and macrophages actually present the T cells and with antigens, um, components of the antigens that actually activate both the T cells and the B cells. So that's called antigen presentation. And that is important in getting a lot of this started. So the that comes from the macrophages presenting small pieces of the antigen to the B cells and getting them to recognize that there is a foreign antigen. 
and there's a way of doing that using the MHC complex, which is not really a component of it, but it's on every cell of the body, which is used to recognize where it's, it's actually part of the uh, immune system, uh, the, the, the host organism or not. I haven't actually mentioned another uh, complex that's to do with that is called the um, uh, membrane attack complex, MAC, which actually is involved with that where that is activated uh, via the complement system, um, which goes in and drills into the um, invading cells to kill them. So that's, that's sort of associated with this process as well at the end of the chain. The antigen presentation um, activates the B cells, B cells and the T cells, which are living throughout the body. Hence, the antibodies are then made, and then they go and use the anti, uh, the antibodies go and attack the actual antigen. And in the, there are various things that the antibodies do. They form complexes, complex formation. They form, they neutralize. In fact, they just jump on the antigen and stop it doing what it might otherwise do. Uh, agglutination, which means they join them all together and make them into a big gluten, glute, yeah, I spelled that wrong, incorrectly, agglutination. They stick them all together and make them a bit uh, not, not uh, able to do what they would have done. And precipitation, well, they actually sometimes bring them out of solution. They're easier to, to gobble up that way. So there is all, these are all processes that antibodies can actually be involved with. Yeah, by the way, the processes, you notice I'm putting in square boxes. These are not components. These are actual processes. Um, I haven't mentioned the... Uh, now, with, with the T-cells, the same thing happens with the T-cells. Mostly the cytotoxic T-cells are, uh, are activated with the help of their helper T-cells. And I haven't mentioned the chemicals that are involved with that. Uh, which are the non-specific ones. Uh, there's two chemicals. One are called interleukins. And these are to do with the T cells, interleukins. Um, and then there is a chemical called perforin. Both of these substances are involved with T cell action. Uh, interleukins activate the communication between the T cells and perforins actually do, the, do uh, drilling into the cells um, once uh, the T cells are activated and actually just destroy some of the uh, invading organisms. Um, <clears throat> so they are, they are associated with uh, T cell function. Um, most of the time, however, the cytotoxic T cell is just sitting there and will operate what's called immunological surveillance. In other words, it's floating around the body, looking at each cell around the body to make sure it's who it should be. So they are survey, surveying the body to make sure that everything is okay. And if they find a cancerous cell or a, um, a foreign body or a destroyed or damaged cell, they'll actually um, uh, start a process to to actually uh, aid the removal of that cell. And I think we're getting close to almost being finished. I just want to finish off by mentioning that the complement is brought into many of these systems, um, the complement of activation, which leads to a number of different processes, but it brings in the MAC complex of proteins, which actually uh, um, is membrane uh, attack complex, which actually drills into foreign bodies. And as we said before, it's a little bit like perforin in its action. The other one is interferon, where this is mainly to do with viral viral processes, mainly to do with viruses. When a cell is invaded with a virus, it's usually doomed to be to die, um, but it, what it can do, it, can, and it can, cannot usually defend itself, but what it can do, it, can, it actually sends out very small amounts of the chemical interferon, which is a peptide, and tells its neighboring cells that it's been in, invaded by a virus, and the neighboring cells uh, 
operate accordingly and, and, and start defending themselves. So interferon is an important um, protein that's a uh, peptide that's used as a communication device. And in some cases it's used for <clears throat> treatments of viruses and some cancers in, in a similar way. <clears throat> I think we've covered most of the stuff. Obviously, it's not everything. We haven't covered everything, but this has then given you an overview of the different components and the interrelationships between them. So hopefully you find that useful and a, and a place to, to start if you can't see the wood from the trees in the case of the this very complicated system. But obviously, it's vital to this, our survival as individual entities and, and successful organisms. Thank you for listening.